everybody has one worship song that you don't like. And think about it. Maybe for you, you just can't stand oceans. I don't know. You're like, they play that chorus 80 times, and I'm good with just 75. <laughs> Maybe there's one that every time it comes on, you're like, ah, oh, this one again. This is my, can I want to get to Reckless Love. Can we get to that one, please? Maybe you argue about it with your friends. I don't know. When I was in high school, 16 years old, I was at a youth conference similar to this one, a little bit smaller. And I was there, and I was grumpy. I was a salty young man because I was away from my girlfriend for a week. Somebody said, aw, we broke up, spoiler alert. <laughs> so I'm not that mad about it. At the time, it was the worst. I was angsty. I had fallen in love with the Lord prior to that, but had kind of been on rough terms with him. And so we're at this conference, and we're having an evening session of worship, a lot like what we did last night. There's adoration. There's music ministry being led by a really great worship leader. And everybody's praying and singing, and I'm in the very back row like this. It's stupid. All these people are fake. Dumb. And I'm having a conversation with God in my head, right? Where I'm like, Lord, I'm doing you a favor by being here. <laughs> giving up time away from my girlfriend, giving up time away from my friends, trying to learn a little bit more about what it means to be a leader and a disciple, and that's all great. So since I'm doing you a favor, I need you to do me a favor, God. I said, Lord, I need you to just prevent the music ministry from playing the worship song that I hate. Because I'm not going to do that. And the worship song that I really hated at the time, and it's an older one, so maybe some of you have never heard it, but it's a song called Breathe. And if you've never heard it, it goes like this. It goes, it's very soft. It's got like some synth, some strings, and a voice. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. <gasps> and then the chorus. And I, 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 I'm desperate for you. And that was the song. Here's the problem with that song for me. <laughs> Thank you. I, I played in a heavy metal band. I was a singer. I know. That's a true story. <laughs> Here's the problem with that song, is whenever I heard it, and I heard that chorus, and uh, I'm desperate for you, I did not think of worshiping the Lord. I thought of this old Whitney Houston song from the 80s, and the chorus to that song goes, and I, I will always love you. Yeah, that's what I thought of. And I can't. I can't do it. I can't pray to the Lord and have Whitney in my head. <laughs> so I'm there. I'm angsty. Lord, just don't let the band play breathe. That's it. I just, I will stay here. You know, I am here for you, and I don't want to sing the song. I no more than 20 seconds later. <laughs> here it comes. This is the air I breathe. <gasps> and now at this point, I should have fallen on my knees in repentance and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because he's heard me, and God's response to me was, that's funny you don't like that song. Here's the song. <laughs> Maybe deal with it. And I should have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Instead, this was my response. Oh, you would like to be that way. Then I'm out. And I left the session for the rest of the night. Deuces, God. It's over. I had this moment, I don't know how the Lord reveals himself to you in these beautiful, touching, hallmark moments. My interactions with God are a little bit more like that, probably because I need it. A little bit of a tap on the face like, hi, I'm in charge. Good talk. I had this moment where 
the Lord in that, in that instance gave me what I needed, but I wasn't necessarily ready to receive it. Christ in that moment was powerfully there for me because I wasn't treating worship as worship. I was treating it about something for me. And the Lord in a very powerful way said, this is not about you. This is about me. But in my pride, I wasn't able to receive that. You know, Jesus has this habit of showing up in places that we don't expect him, that we're not ready to see him. As we end this particular conference weekend, I think about a passage from the Gospel of Luke. It's at the very end in chapter 24, if you want to go back and read the whole thing on the bus or in the car ride home. And these two disciples are walking to a town called Emmaus. And Emmaus is a little ways away from Jerusalem, so they're leaving. They're going presumably back home. And they're talking to each other about all the things that had happened. So Jesus has been crucified, he's been put in the tomb, he's dead. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So Jesus comes alongside of these two people who had followed Jesus, they had heard Jesus teach. Presumably they may have even been close to Jesus, maybe part of the 70 or 72 who went out to cast out demons and proclaim the kingdom of God. But now Jesus is in their midst in a different situation and in a different circumstance, and they don't recognize him. And they talk. They have a conversation. Jesus teaches them. And they drew near to the village to which they were going. And Jesus appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, stay with us. It's toward evening, and the day is far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished out of their sight. Have you ever had a moment where somebody showed up in a place where you didn't expect them and you didn't recognize them right away? And you had to have that awkward conversation where like they know you and they're like, hey, how are you doing? And you're like, you. Dude, it is you. The guy. What's up? And they're like, you don't know me. I'm like, not a clue. But if you put them in the right context in your school, back at a particular conference, in the, in the Starbucks where they work, you'd be like, oh, that's that person. And see, context sometimes matters in being able to place the people we know. Jesus actually shows up a couple of times where people don't recognize him throughout the Gospels. There's this one account in John chapter 20, again, after he's been crucified and laid in the tomb, where Mary goes to the tomb. And she goes there and she sees these two angelic figures inside the tomb and Jesus' body is gone. And so she gets distressed and they say, Jesus isn't here. And she goes outside of the tomb, freaked out, and she sees Jesus, but she doesn't know it's Jesus. Instead, she thinks it's just a gardener. You see, she's used to Jesus the way she knew Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher. She saw him die, and yet... In this new context, she doesn't know that it's him. Even when Jesus was alive, there's one instance where Jesus comes towards the disciples on a boat in a storm, and he's walking on the water. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 14, it says that the disciples looked out and were terrified. They said, it's a ghost. And Jesus has to speak, take heart, it is I. They don't recognize him because, understandably so, if you saw a friend of yours walking on water, you'd be like, that's some bad chicken I ate yesterday. You wouldn't put it all together. Another instance, Jesus is about to get thrown off a cliff. All of these people in this mob are angry and they're rushing at him. And yet, in the Gospel of Mark, it says he just slipped through their midst, undetected. Nobody recognized him. We have places that we expect to find Jesus. We have places where we expect to see the Lord. In that particular worship song, oh, when they play that song, that's when I really pray. In that moment of adoration on Saturday night, it's got to be Saturday night and it's got to be in this section. In reconciliation, but only if it's at a Steubenville conference and only if it is not with my parish priest. I know it's the same Jesus, but you know. You know. We have these places that we expect to have an encounter. And those things aren't necessarily bad to have those sort of expectations. In fact, it's a good thing to want to come to a Steubenville conference and say, I want to go there, and you know what? I expect to encounter the Lord there. I expect to encounter him in some way. 
It gets toxic when we start to say, I need to encounter Jesus in this way. I need the band to play that song. I need us to do adoration in this way. I need to have a really good homily. Otherwise, like, I can't pay attention during Mass. Like, to put those kinds of expectations, that's not a good thing. But to show up to a place and say, I expect to find the Lord there, that's not a bad thing. It's what happens after this conference. As we walk back to our homes, to the places where we came from, will we recognize Jesus there? Jesus shows up in unexpected places, and sometimes the places where we would least expect to find Jesus are the places that we should most expect to find Jesus. I think about your, your parish when you go back. Last night it was incredible watching all of you in adoration. As the Lord moved up and down these aisles, I just imagine it in the same way he used to move among crowds when he walked with a body like you and I on earth. And how people would, would go towards him and press in on him. That's what you did last night. In fact, some of you, I watched you grab your friends arm in arm and walk them towards the center aisles just so you could get closer to the Lord. Yet, how many of us are going to go back to our parishes and three weeks from now be like, just like Father Mike said, I'm too tired to get up to go to Mass. How many of us, when our friends start to drop off a little bit, will be bold enough to grab them and say, hey, you, you're having a rough time. Do you know what we need? A holy hour. Come with me to our, to our perpetual adoration chapel. Come with me to sit in our church in front of the tabernacle. The same Christ who was here last night is the same Christ who sits in the silence of your adoration chapel, in the silence of the church by that tabernacle. The same Christ you receive at Mass do we as willingly put ourselves in front of him? You see, the challenge with this type of weekend is that it's incredible, but for many of us, we let this be the only thing that sustains our faith through the year. And then we come back so broken and so hurt, and we wonder why. Well, I expect to find Jesus there. But every single week, in fact, daily, you have an opportunity to encounter Jesus in mass. And that's a place you'd expect to find him. Reconciliation. We go to reconciliation here. We have a beautiful moment. Mercy, forgiveness, grace pours over us. And you could do that every single week. And we only offer confession for 15 minutes on a Saturday. Then get there and be first in line. Make encountering Jesus in the places you should expect to find him a priority. A lot of people came here with a youth group or a small group. When you go back, lean into those things. Expect to find Christ in your small group. Expect to find him in the conversations you'll have, in the accountability you'll have with those people. It is not an easy life today to be a Catholic or a Christian. There are things that are challenging. But you know what? Any lifestyle has challenges. The difference in a Catholic Christian lifestyle is we meet our challenges with the grace that God provides with the community that we're given, with the strength we find in the Eucharist, with the forgiveness we find in reconciliation. Yeah, it's a difficult life sometimes, but every life is difficult, but you have things to help elevate you beyond that. Places where Christ is revealed. But I wonder, do we lean into them and say, I expect to find Jesus in the mundane, quiet moments of my small group, in those conversations. I expect to find Jesus at the mass that I'm going to go to next Sunday, where instead of this incredible music ministry playing reckless love, somebody is on a guitar or a piano and they're playing gather us in, and I can't find the right page in my gather comprehensive hymnal. But what happens at that Mass is the same thing that's about to happen here. The Holy Spirit will transubstantiate bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And you receive that. Now here's the thing. As you go forward, there is still a tension because we find Christ in those expected places, but we need some more empowerment. We need something to energize us. And that thing is the Holy Spirit. On Friday night, Emily talked beautifully about the love of God the Father. Last night, Gomer talked about the love of, of God the Father revealed through Jesus Christ on the cross and his sacrifice for us, ultimately presented in the Eucharist. And Jesus Christ promises this Holy Spirit, an advocate. And the Holy Spirit 
is the love between God the Father and God the Son. It begets a third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Jesus promises this to his disciples as they're getting ready to go out. Before Jesus is crucified, he says, I'm going to send you another. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, you've already encountered it. Did you pray this weekend? That's the Holy Spirit. No one can pray except through the Holy Spirit. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. So when you pray, you're aided by the Spirit. Perhaps you had an experience of charismatic gifts last night. That's the Holy Spirit. And we can ask for more of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we should ask for more of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that took the disciples and the apostles who maybe were a little bit scared to go out and preach and turned them into bold evangelists. It's the Holy Spirit that transforms hearts and turns us towards Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals Jesus to us. Last night, Gomer started off his talk by saying, let's pray the most dangerous prayer in the world, come Holy Spirit. And it's a dangerous prayer because once we open up our lives to the Holy Spirit, we start to live a life that is unexpected. That can transform us and can transform the way we see the world. See, the Holy Spirit is the love of God the Father and God the Son, and we ask for the Holy Spirit. We can pray this dangerous prayer, come Holy Spirit, and then we can add this on, reveal Christ to me. Reveal Jesus in the unexpected places. Give me eyes to see him in my world. I was driving through Phoenix a couple of weeks ago and just reflecting on some things that I've been reading. And I was thinking about God's heart. The heart of God. And as I'm praying, I'm driving. I was going up to a parish about 50 minutes away from me. And I'm on the highway and I pulled off the highway and started to just say, Lord, like, show me your heart. Reveal your heart to me. And within about two minutes, I passed four homeless people. I get it. Reveal your heart to me, Lord. And there I was confronted with the poor. Jesus even tells us he's going to show up in unexpected places, and we have to ask the Holy Spirit to help us see him there. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, there's this account where Jesus is judging the nations. And the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Unexpected places. Where is the place you feel you are least likely to encounter Christ when you go back into your world? There are places that we should expect to find Jesus. At a Steubenville conference, absolutely. Come back every single year and be recharged here in this big community. When else do you get to hang out with 4,500 of your closest Catholic friends, have some incredible music ministry, listen to great talks, and just be able to hang out with your goofy youth ministers? Not a lot of places. (laughs) Unless you know something I don't know about. And if so, invite me. So this is good. We can expect to find Jesus when we go to Mass. In fact, we should. Sometimes that becomes the unexpected place. Well, I don't expect to get anything out of Mass anymore. The homily's not good, but we should expect to find Jesus there. We should expect to encounter him in reconciliation. But then we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to reveal the places that we don't expect to find Jesus. The places we wrestle with finding Jesus. Every day you wake up, there's an opportunity to encounter him. But will you? Will you encounter the Lord the same way you you poured yourselves toward him last night in adoration? In the Gospel of Matthew, that particular passage is critical. It's what Jesus says brings people into the kingdom. When you see the poor, what do you see? When you see the stranger, the other, the outcast, what do you see? When you hear about people on the margins, on the fringes, those that society has left behind, what do you see? A problem? Politics? Bad decisions? Criminals? Or do you first see the person? And then beyond the person, do you say, Holy Spirit, help me see Christ in that person? 
Help me be Christ to that person. Help me encounter him. Because here's the thing. If you're going to encounter Jesus in unexpected places in our world, and you will. You'll have moments you'll find Jesus in the sick. But that means you need to be near the sick. Gomer last night talked about going to prison ministry. That's a part of Matthew 25. I was in prison and you visited me. Jesus is in the prisoners. But I know a lot of people who might just say, well, those people made their decisions. Why would we try to ease their punishment for the horrible things they've done? And no doubt they've done horrible things. And no doubt they're in need of God's mercy as much as you and I. So who are we to stand as the judge? But when we encounter Jesus in those unexpected places, in your schools, can you see Christ in your classmates and encounter him there? Can you see Christ in your enemy, in the person who's hurt you? Can you see the dignity of God as he looks at them and says, I call them to be my children too, which makes them your brothers and sisters. Could you see that? And if not, that's okay, but you need to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to you. Because when he's revealed, that becomes the moment where we get to respond. When we encounter Christ, anytime somebody encounters Christ, they have an opportunity to respond. That moment when the scales sort of fall from their eyes and they see clearly, they get a chance. For the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, they suddenly realized it was Jesus in the breaking of the bread. They saw this act as something new. And perhaps for you, when you go back to your parish, this next Sunday Mass, maybe it's boring, maybe it's not what you want it to be. But at that moment where the priest says, behold the Lamb of God, behold he who takes away the sins of the world, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. You look and you say, my Lord and my God, and your eyes are open. And Mass at your parish is never the same. For Mary Magdalene, she looked at, at Jesus, and when it was revealed that it was Jesus, she ran and she told those who were not there. Perhaps when you let go of the idea of Jesus just as a teacher or as a prophet or some good moral guy, you too will run and share the good news with those. Because if Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to you, why would you not share that with others who need the healer? For Peter, when he recognized it was Jesus out on the water, he asked to have a greater faith so he could walk to and do the impossible. And I know we, we get on Peter for falling, but bear in mind that Peter got almost all the way to Jesus before he fell and then walked with Jesus back to that boat. He did the impossible through Christ. You must too become Christ. You must be the Jesus that goes to the unexpected places in our world. Because for 4,500 people in this room, there are tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands just in the Dallas area who do not know Jesus, who have never encountered his love. Maybe they've encountered a distortion of it. Maybe they're angry about it. But they're not in this room to experience the love of God the Father poured out and expressed through Jesus Christ the Son and given to us through the Holy Spirit. They're not here for that. And they never will be. But they'll meet you. They'll meet you. And you can become the unexpected intrusion of Jesus Christ into their lives. I heard this saying a while ago. It's like, you might be the only gospel people ever read. And I don't really like it because I was going to add something to it. You may be the first gospel people ever read, but you shouldn't be the last. See, that last is because it, it, it says there's movement, right? Maybe I encounter somebody and I become the unexpected intrusion, but then I get to walk them towards the real gospel. You have that ability, but only through that Holy Spirit that empowers us to go out, that lets us say Jesus Christ is Lord, to become the unexpected response to the unexpected encounter of Jesus in the world. We can become Christ revealed to our world. A world that is so in desperately need of Jesus. That's why we're here. You see, when I was 15, I had a moment where I was at a Steubenville conference like this one. And I fell on my face and I looked at the monstrance and I said, my Lord and my God. And I knew that Jesus was real. At 16, I was an angry, salty teenager who left a conference because God didn't give me what I wanted. And I learned that my faith wasn't about me. 17 through like, you know, now, 
I realized that I am a sinner in need of God's mercy. (laughs) 18 was a rough year. (laughs) And along the way, I realized that it was completely selfish of me if every day I woke up saying yes to a God that I believe changed the world to hold that inside. You see, we're not here. Ike, Emily, Paul, Gomer, like, we're not here because we think this is really cool. Oh, we get to be on stage and there's lights. And Father Mike didn't decide to become a priest because he's like, I look really good in a green chasuble. (laughs) Brings out my eyes. We did this. We're here. This is all because in the team, all those people Paul thanked, because we had an encounter with Jesus who changed our lives in unexpected ways. With a Lord who called us out of mediocrity, called us out of our plans and routines, and asked us to be something more. Asked us to be something great, and didn't just say, go be something great, figure it out, but said, I will give you all that you need to be who I want you to be. We don't just do this because it's fun. This isn't because of some idea or some concept. This whole weekend was about a person. The person of Jesus Christ. The person who we encountered powerfully in mass, who we encountered incredibly in adoration, who we worship in prayer, and who you will go and meet in the streets, who you will encounter in your schools and in your families. And when you do have that unexpected encounter, you have an obligation, brothers and sisters, to be ready to become Christ in that moment, to be the unexpected encounter of Christ in a world that needs him. And that moment for you can begin today. When I was at that first Steubenville conference, they gave me a card. It's a lot like a card you've got in your hand right now. It's a commitment card. And they asked us to make a commitment to living for Jesus Christ. They said, you have a chance to say yes to the Lord. Because here's the thing, John chapter 15 says, it was not you who chose me, but I who chose you to go bear fruit and fruit that will remain. You see, Jesus has already chosen you. You are chosen and you are loved. You are picked. I need to step back for a second because I don't know if some of you have ever heard that. You're chosen. You specifically. Take away all of these people in the room, make it just you, and I'd still look right at you and I'd say, you're chosen. It'd be weird because there's a lot of empty seats and just you, but I'd still do it. Jesus chooses you. That means that you don't get to choose Jesus. You get to respond to Jesus. And that's what this commitment card is all about. When I was 15, I responded to Jesus. I said, yes, Lord, you are my Lord, you are my God, you are my Savior. I want to follow you, I want to be a disciple. And it didn't mean I said I'm going to be perfect from here on out. It said I'm going to try. And it didn't say this is the only yes I get to make and then I get to live my life however I want. It meant I'm going to say yes every single day. From the moment I wake up, I'll say, yes, Lord, I will follow you and be a disciple today. And at the end of the day, when I'm a complete failure, I look at the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I tried and I failed today, but I will still follow you. I will run to reconciliation to be reconciled with you. You see, yes to Jesus is an everyday yes. To allowing Jesus to break into our lives in unexpected and magnificent ways. And a yes to being Jesus in unexpected and powerful ways to those around us. It's a yes to an unexpected adventure. I was supposed to be a doctor. Dr. Stepanek has a nice ring to it, though. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm here. We're here. You're here. And as I was extended that invitation when I was 15, I want to extend that invitation to you. Some of you may have never said yes to Jesus, never given your lives to Christ, committed your life to Jesus. That's a commitment you make every single day. But today, for some of you, might be the first day. And right now, maybe your heart is just beating in your chest because you know, you know that that's a big commitment. Those words you speak, and once you speak them, Jesus says, okay, let's go. And some of you maybe have made that commitment before. But today, I want to give you an opportunity to recommit. To say, Lord, I I want to re-up my obligation. I want to re-up my commitment to being a disciple. And so I want you to close your eyes and just open up your hands.
of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings courage. The Holy Spirit convicts hearts. Right now, you know that you can't do this on your own. Right now, you know that Jesus has something more. Right now, you know that the road is going to be challenging. Right now, you know that you can walk with Jesus through anything. And so if you are somebody, if, even if you've, if you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, or if you have committed it, and this is like the 50th, 100th time, I want you just to pray with me. And you can pray silently or you can pray out loud. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave your life up on the cross for me and rose that I might have life. You are my Lord, my Savior, my God. At your name, my fears tremble and fall. At your name, adversity does not stand against me. Consecrate me in your name, Lord. I give my heart to you. I respond to your invitation to be a disciple. just to take a second if you're still on the fence I'm not going to move through this quick just to be with the Lord to continue to commit yourself to that when I fell in love with my wife and I told her for the first time I like gushed about it I just kept telling her how much I loved her over and over again when we got married for the next like couple days we just kept looking at each other and like I, I commit to you I, we're married in this moment I want you just to take a second if you're committing your life to Jesus just to let him know your heart, your commitment. For those of you who are making a commitment to Jesus or a recommitment right now, just continue to do that. But I know there's people in this room who you're like, I can't. I know that's a big thing and right now I'm just not ready. And I want to pray with you for a second too. If you're struggling to make that commitment for whatever reason, I just want... I want to pray with you, Lord. I pray for continued courage as these people seek to find you, seek to commit to you. Lord, I, co I come against any barriers or roadblocks that exist in their lives and you would continue to work in their heart as you work powerfully. Lord, put people in their lives to guide them. Lord, continue to make them open and walk with them on the journey. Just because they can't see you, Lord, doesn't mean you aren't there. that card if you've made a commitment to Jesus even if today is like your second, third, fiftieth time or it's your first time uh, after this session, I want you to write today's date on that card and I want you to put it somewhere where you can see it every day it only, it only has to be you it doesn't have to be like up in your locker someone's like what that's, what's that weird business card and you're like today I committed my life to Jesus put it on your bathroom mirror put it put it like on your toothbrush I don't know Somewhere you'll see it every single day. Not to remind you of this day, but to remind you that every day you say yes. Every day you say, yes, Lord, I want to I wanna wake up and I want to be the unexpected intrusion into somebody's life so I can be Jesus to them. Yes, Lord, I'm willing to encounter you so that you may be revealed to me. Yes, Lord. that commitment for the first time though today Paul and I want to pray with you I want everybody else to pray with you so if today was the first time you said yes to Jesus you committed your life to Christ could you please stand today was is a day I hope you never forget and soon you'll be one of these people in these seats recommitting. I pray that you say yes every day. This is the beginning of the journey, brothers and sisters, but it's not the end. For all of those who are in the seats, if you would just kind of put a hand up to whoever's closest to you. We want to pray with you. We want to just celebrate the decision you've made and pray for strength in the journey. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Lord God, I ask you to bless my brothers and sisters. I ask you to pour your Holy Spirit on them, those people who have made a commitment to Jesus for the first time. That today would be the first but not the last moment they say yes. That you would sustain them on the journey. That you would give them strength in the decisions they need to make to walk as a disciple. That you would guide them and guide their hearts. That you would give them encouragement and consolation along the way. That your Holy Spirit would be a continued guide and consoler and helper to them. And that this day would be a day that they identify as a place they said yes. For the first time of a million times. Until they see your face in the kingdom.